So I want to introduce Deanna, the founder of Balzac's Coffee. Um, she's currently also the president. Uh, Ms. Olson graduated from the University of British Columbia in 1988 with a Bachelor of Arts degree majoring in French literature. After a few years of travel and job jumping, she started her company in Toronto in 1993 with a small coffee kiosk. She now has seven locations in southern Ontario, the last two of which were made possible due to the funding she received from the new partners on Dragon's Den, Arlene Dickinson and Bruce Cruxon. After successful appearance on the Dragon's Den, um, besides running her small coffee empire, Ms. Olson is an avid hockey player, a proud mother to her delightful six-year-old daughter, Annabelle. So please join me in welcoming uh, Deanna. Hello. Thank you, Heather, and thank you uh, to Arlene, although she's not here anymore, for a fantastic presentation. Talk about a tough act to follow. Um, so <laughs> I've had much less experience public speaking than her, so it's almost cruel to put me up here after her, but <laughs> so you'll have to bear with me. I am reading from my notes. Um, and the last time I was asked to uh, speak in front of a group of people was a couple of months ago in Stratford, and it was for the Rotary Club. Now, I failed to take, take into account that the, um, the average age of that group is about 75 years old, and uh, to make matters worse, I was speaking after um, a lunch so of meat and potatoes. So uh, basically, I was speaking during nap time for this group, and uh, yeah, so about 10 seconds into my speech, I looked up and m more than half of the audience was just <sighs> so, so that's why I, today I handed out uh, some chocolate covered espresso beans <laughs> to avoid that from happening. I do remember in university being very sleep deprived. So, you know, even though you're about 50 years younger as the average age here, um, I know it, it can get tiring. So anyhow, um, I'm going to share with you today uh, how I started out in my business, how I grew my business to where it is now, and where, am I, where I am going to take it from here, or more like, where am I going to take it from here? Because this is a huge question for myself and for my partners right now. So how I started, when I uh, graduated from university way, way back when, I had no career path planned. I had no idea what I wanted to do, nor was I particularly driven or ambitious. I floated around, dabbling in various things, did a lot of traveling. And in 1991, I found myself working in a customer service job for a financial company in Markham. And I was suffering from boredom and a complete lack of challenge. So while sitting in my little fluorescent lit gray cubicle, desperate for an escape, I began to envision and design a French-styled cafe and coffee roasting company that would bring together my passion for France, for coffee, and for literature. It was my dream job, and the more I fantasized about it, the more it struck me that perhaps this was actually not a bad idea, and that there was nothing stopping me from giving this a try. And I think it was out of desperation and necessity, otherwise I would have probably gone crazy in the position I was in at the time. So I saved up some money, I managed to procure a new venture loan, which is a government guaranteed loan um, that encourages, uh, I'm not sure if they're still around nowadays, but they encouraged entrepreneurs back in the early 90s. Um, so I, I got a little bit of money, I learned to roast coffee, I bought a roaster, I bought an espresso machine, and I bought a modular kiosk, and I spent a couple of years selling coffee at Ontario Place and Exhibition Place. And uh, I don't want to get you, give you the impression that this was like easy. It was very difficult. It was, uh, I had to keep calling up my dad and getting them to send me some money so I could pay my rent and pay for food. And, you know, he, he did have faith in me and I did eventually pay him back. So, um, so thanks, Dad. Um, I opened my first cafe in Stratford in 1996. Um, I chose Stratford because of the large demographic of creative and artistic people that were living 
and working there uh, with the Stratford Festival. I knew that my concept would appeal to this crowd, who at the time had no options for coffee other than Tim Hortons. And luckily my instincts were right, and Balzac's became the town's meeting place for locals, tourists, and, and actors. It was, it was and still is a hive of creative energy. At the time, okay, this is part two of my, my talk about where the growth came. So at the time I had no specific plans to expand. Although I was open to the possibility, I was not actively seeking new locations. In fact, I never have. I think growth came to me as a result of getting my concept right in the first place. I built a business that resonated with people. That cafe got people talking, creating a buzz about this new and fresh approach to the stale and bland landscape of the coffee industry at the time. That expansion, from there, the expansion of my company came naturally as developers approached me because they were looking for something unique in their developments and they appreciated my concept. To this day, that is my golden rule for expansion. Let them come to me. There is a much more collaborative relationship developed with the landlord when you know you are wanted more than just filling four walls and paying rent. They chose Balzac's because they wanted to attract other unique businesses to the development they were working on. So my success was very important to their success. Being approached by the developers of the distillery di district was a game-changing moment for Balzac's. I was to be the first uh, business to open there, so it was a risk to sign on to this. But to be part of this incredible, beautiful, and unique development was also an opportunity that comes along only once in a lifetime, and it was impossible to say no. They allowed me to tour the 30 plus buildings and allowed me to choose the location that I have now. Turns out it was a very good choice. And as many of you probably know, the distillery district is hugely successful as a district, and we have a very busy and popular cafe there. So following the success of my second location, I was then approached by the developers for the toy factory lost in Liberty Village. These were very early days for the revitalization of Liberty Village. So again, I was taking a calculated risk by building a cafe based on the potential for population growth in the area. It was very quiet at the time. Um, again, this turned out to be a good move. As you know, how busy and desirable this neighborhood has become, or as many of you may know. So with each successive location, it was the same story and this continues now. Daily, I receive requests to consider opening locations, some locally, some as far as China and Mexico. So to summarize the growth of Balzac's, um, one, growth came as a result of making an indelible first impression which piqued people's curiosity, got people talking, developed credibility, made people want to become a part of what we are doing. In other words, um, I built a strong brand right from the get-go. Now, I didn't realize I was doing this at the time. In fact, I didn't even know what branding meant when I started. Um, I'm not schooled in any of this, but uh, I think because I had a concept that was very cohesive and that I did sit there in that cubicle and doodle and fantasize and I knew that it wasn't just about creating a logo. I knew it was about creating a, a whole concept of a company that was unique. And um, my brand has really not changed a lot over the years. So, you know, I think that says a lot for, for just getting it right the first time. Um, so, Golden New, or my summary number two is the golden rule to let them come to you. Now, this, this has worked very well for me, uh, especially being a, a coffee company. When, when you are, when landlords want you to be there and you're the first person in a developed uh, neighborhood before it's kind of taken off, um, you know, you're taking a calculated risk, but um, and by calculated, I mean, you know, you have to do your research, but you also have to go with your intuition. And, you know, you might not get it right. I'm not going to talk about it today, but I did open a location once. 
that didn't succeed. So it happens. One out of seven isn't bad. But if you do get it right, it allows you to ride on the coattails of growth in a community. It allows you to establish deep roots in that community um, because you were there first. In the case of the cafe, this served us extremely well as we became the go-to meeting place, the heart of each community we were in. So that brings me to the third and final part of my presentation, which is where do we go from here? So when I went on the Dragon's Den, my short-term goal was to raise capital to open that Ryerson and the Reference Library. And now that that goal has been achieved, what is our next move? For me, having Bruce and Arlene as partners was not just to get those two locations off the ground, but to bring in strategic partners that would help me navigate the direction that this company would go in. I want to draw on their experience, their connections, their resources, and their high-profile personalities to bring this company to a level that I could not otherwise do on my own. Currently, we are working on a strategy. Uh, in fact, it's happening in the next few days where we, we do make a decision, um, but nothing yet is off the table. So here are some of the options. Um, and these are broken into large um, sections, but it could be a combination of any of these. There's like literally an infinite number of possibilities that we have um, moving forward. Um, we could stay right where we are. That's always an option. But I don't think my partners are going to let me do that, even if I wanted to do that. So, um, you know, we. one thing about the Balzac's brand is I think the brand is actually bigger than the company itself. So there's, there's, this is an opportunity to build the company to, to be as big as the brand has become. And that's a lot in part thanks to um, the Dragon's Den, the publicity we got. Um, the, the downside to this is, you know, a lot of our customers have the impression that we are like a big company. And they'd be very surprised to know we only have three people in the head office, including myself. And, you know, a lot of people will hold, I'm, I'm complimented by the comparison to, to Starbucks on the one level, but it also, we, we're kind of hold, held to a level of expectation that is really tough for us to meet. Um, for example, our, our loyalty program. We have a very simple loyalty card, very basic, the way it works. And doesn't require a lot of work on our side because we're too busy doing other things, quite frankly, than to worry about the loyalty card for now. But we do get a lot of customers tweeting us or emailing us saying, you know, what's that? Why, why don't you do what Starbucks does? Why don't you blah, 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 you know, making that comparison. And, you know, to put it into perspective, Starbucks has almost 18,000 locations worldwide we have seven, so they're about 3,000 times the size that we are. And they probably have 100 people just working on loyalty card programs. And they can, they can glean the information from the cards, the information that the public will give them, that their customers will give them, and do marketing studies with that information. And I'm sure as marketers you know there's, there's a lot of am amazing things that you can do with them getting the information on your customer and the demographic and market studies, but we're just not there yet. So anyways, I'm just saying with, with our brand, sometimes it's, it's frustrating when we're held to this level that we're just not there yet. Um, now, I don't mind it when people make comparisons um, to Starbucks that, that we're doing a better job than them. I'm, I'm all good with that, so um, keep those coming. Um, so yeah, uh, staying right where, where we are is probably not an option. Um, so if we're going to grow, franchising would be an obvious choice. Now when you think of franchising, you think of cookie cutter and you think of um, you know, rapid expansion. The, the traditional model of a franchise is cookie cutter. It's, it's supposed to be very simple you know, and very easy to repeat over and over and over again. 
Now, I think that flies in the face of our brand. I don't think our brand is cut out for that. Um, however, it's, it is not off the table because, you know, I think we could think out of the box and create a model of a franchise that, that works for our brand. So it's, uh, it is a possibility. Um, we could expand corporately as we have, so just have our own cafes, not franchised. Um, we could expand nationally. We could grow new hubs across Canada. We could expand internationally. We could expand the wholesale roasting side of our business, uh, much like Kicking Horse has done out west, if you're familiar with them. So bottom line is that this company is at a very important and exciting juncture. Uh, we have many possible roads to take, so it will be interesting to see where we are in a few years from now. And who knows, maybe by then we will have our own marketing department and some of you will be part of our team. So um, thank you for allowing me to share my story with you and uh, I wish you all the very best in your future endeavors. And uh, I'm going to answer some questions now. Uh, the first question we had was, um, in the clip we saw before Arlene spoke, um, you were complimented on your pitch on Dragon's Den. And how did you come up with the strategy behind it and how long did you spend sort of creating the pitch for the dragons? Um, well, I, I, people had suggested I go on the dragon's den and I just thought that was just a crazy suggestion and rolled my eyes at it. But then when I did um, win the competitive bids for Ryerson and the reference library, those are the two locations, by the way, that they helped open. Um, I had to come up with funding. I mean, I, I actually like signed on and had no idea where I was going to get the money from. So I basically did all uh, anything and everything to, to try and do this, Dragon's Den being one of the things I, I did. So I went and auditioned for it and uh, didn't really know what my pitch was going to look like at that time, but just they, I think with the Dragon's Den, they pick, they pick companies that are legitimate and then they pick companies that I know are going, they know are going to be entertaining because um, it is a TV show after all. But uh, I think I fell under the category of being a legitimate company, and uh, I felt pretty confident they weren't going to humiliate me on TV because my company already had proven itself. Um, mind you, the pitch, um, you know, they edit it so that it kind of comes out completely different from, I, I was up there talking for 45 minutes with them. And uh, like when they asked me what are my profits are and I said 25%, well that was actually from a different question. <laughs> and my, my profits aren't 25%. Um, it, it was a similar question, but it was, I, I had framed that 25%, you know, with a well before my salary, before blah, 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 blah. Our profits aren't anywhere near 25%. And it, it's kind of, when I saw that on TV, I was like, oh, no, <laughs> this is not, not even close. But uh, we're working towards like maybe 15%, but that, that would be a, a great thing to get there. So um, yeah, so and creating the, uh, the, the little cafe and all that, um, one person on our, our team who, who takes care of all the cafes, he does all the maintenance, he has a degree in um, theater set design. So he was like, let me take care of this, and he did an awesome job. So. Great. Um, so we have a question about, while in business school, if you're interested in becoming an entrepreneur, what would you say the most important things to do are during your time at school and afterwards? Sort of, what would your t top tips be? Um, I don't know, study hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, be, <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're going to be an entrepreneur, your, your grades don't matter as much, but what, it's more about what you're learning that matters than what the grades are. I mean, great, grades can get you a, a better job in a, in a larger corporation, but being an entrepreneur, I mean, you know, you could just go with audit the courses now. <laughs> um, so pay attention, and uh, I've got all the uh, <laughs> faculty up here. Pay attention to your professor. And um, yeah, I mean, like Arlene said, uh, let that 
entrepreneurial spirit grow within you um, because it does like she said it does you know when the more responsibilities you have you know it is a risk um, the more responsibilities you have the, the scarier it is but I do have one really good point and I was talking to a, a, I made a, a friend the other day who's started her own business or she's had a business for a long time and we were comparing our experience and um, I actually started Balzac's with a friend and this was early early on before I'd had a cafe or anything and she early on um, went and got a, a real job and so I was kind of running the company and we ended up we had a shotgun clause in our partnership agreement so I ended up exercising that and, and the company became mine for a dollar plus all the debt and everything. So again, I took the risk. But that was a big lesson for me. I, I only chose to start my company with a friend because it seemed a lonely thing to do, to work by myself, doing all the research myself, not having someone to bounce everything off of. And, you know, but at the end of the day, you have to split the you know, you have to live off of, so you have to make a living doing this. I mean, you have to make two livings as opposed to one early days for a, a small business. Um, so I would just, it, it's okay to partner with someone if, if they're bringing a skill set that's required that kind of complements your own skill set, but don't just do it because you don't want to be all by yourself. And, you know, it's better to be by yourself. It's better to be one person running the show. So that's a one word of advice I can give you. Um, another question is, what was your most challenging situation so far in starting your business and growing it? And what did you do to sort of overcome those challenges? Oh, there's been so many. Um, I, I think challenges has always been funding. Um, and that's, you know, I've been around long enough that Sometimes funding can be easy, sometimes it's not. It depends on the economy and what the banks are doing. And like I said in the Dragon's Den, if you're planning on opening a restaurant or a food service, like it drives me crazy that they consider Balzac's a restaurant. We're so, the coffee industry is so different, but for the fact there's tables and chairs in the room. They're completely different animals. And the restaurant industry is way riskier than the coffee industry. But, um, Anyways, I uh, can't even remember what the question was, but uh, funding, um, yeah, uh, that was the hardest thing for me, and I think that spend, takes up a lot of your time if you're a creative person like me, and you have to deal with um, all that side of it. It's, it's, uh, it's frustrating, but there's no way around it, really. I mean, unless you've got some rich relative that's, you know, going to help you, you have to... You have to go out there and get it, and uh, and it doesn't change. Even now, um, where we are now, we we still need to go out and get capital. We can't. We don't make enough to just finance our own growth. So you know, I'm hoping that that's what Arlene and Bruce will take over doing. Because I am tired of that part. Of it. I want to. I want to be in the cafes, focusing on the customer experience, and not be out. You know, trying to trying to find money. So. <laughs> Some people enjoy that, but sorry. <laughs> Following up on sort of your ending, um, are you worried about possibly losing the ambiance of your current cafes if you do adopt a franchising model? Yes, that's a really good question. I think I touched on that. Um, that is something that I think we need to be really careful about. Um, it's almost like I've quality has been so important to me and you know I've put quality before profits and the bigger you get and the more logistically challenging it is you know I can see how quality would suffer and, and it's also Balzac's is kind of in between that independent cafe and that coffee chain we're kind of right in the middle there um, the indie cafes are great and fantastic. I love how it's a, an expression of the own. Each each one is so different, and it's an expression of the owner. But you know, I think developers 
see me and will come to me just because I've I've already proven myself a few times. So yeah, it's it's like where where is it that tipping point where you become just another chain? And and maybe it, even if you haven't, maybe if we still do a fantastic job and do what we've been doing, the perception will be, oh, Balzacs are everywhere, blah blah blah. So I don't want to be on, I've always said I don't want to be on every street corner of every intersection. I don't think we belong in, in shopping malls. Um, I think we need to remain community, like go into communities and neighborhoods and um, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And honestly, like that's, that's a question that keeps me up at night. Like I, I don't have the answer yet. So watch and see <laughs> where we take it. Maybe you'll be studying Balzer future marketing classes. will be studying Balzac's, you know, what not to do. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Over expanding. So this is a bit of an interesting one. Um, since you say literature, what would you say if you had to pick one book that has significantly impacted you both in business and personally? Um, uh, for me, the Bible. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I've spent a lot of time like contemplating, praying about you know God, you know, show me what the right thing to do is. So whether it's the Bible or or whatever uh, spiritual thing, um, that's actually helped me a lot. Um, I don't read I I don't read business books. You know, I'm not really uh, so. I would have to say. Being inspired by Balzac, I've read many of his his works, um, and you know, but he wasn't that great financially at business either. So he struggled his entire life financially. So we're we're not uh, too too different that way. But um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I'll have to think of something for my next presentation. Is there um, anything in particular you learned from the one location that did not succeed that you've been that you've put in place to sort of prevent in other locations? Yes, um, I broke my golden rule with that location. So I saw this up and coming development in Niagara Falls, and um, I really liked the looks of it, the potential of it. It was a lot of galleries opening, and it just had a really great feel. And uh, so I kind of maneuvered my way and talked to the people there and you know got a really beautiful location um, but the the development fell flat and you know a couple of years into it I realized it was not going to work so so I uh, yeah had to shut shut the door so you know live and learn and it doesn't you know my golden rule again this is another thing Will I break that rule in the future with expansion? You know, I, I don't know if I'm going to be the one going out there looking for locations, but if this company grows to that next level, is there going to be a department in the company that is looking for opportunities? Right now, we don't need to. They are coming to us like rapid fire. Um, I can't keep up with the emails we get from developers in Ottawa and Quebec and all over Toronto, all over Southern Ontario that would like us to open a Balzac's in their, you know, their development. So, won't be a while, but, yeah. Excellent. Um, a question sort of regarding Arlene, I guess, a little bit. How much time and sort of, how much work do your investors, Bruce and Arlene from Dragon's Den, sort of put into the company, and how is it uh, after you appeared on Dragon's Den, sort of creating that relationship and moving forward with them? Um, they have uh, a guy uh, that I deal with mostly, to be honest, and he's wonderful. And I, I think, to be honest, on a daily basis, I'd rather be dealing with Ron, who's the guy. Um, because he's just he's he, you know, he he's there he's focused he's you know he he really has the time um, I mean let's face it Arlene she's busy she's she's very busy so when I do have time with her it's I really appreciate it 
We mostly talk on the phone. We mostly do conference calls. Um, we're meeting this week. We have a big strategic meeting this week. Um, Bruce and I, we probably meet once a month and just have a coffee and talk about things. But Arlene's kind of taken me under her wing because her experience is more in retail, whereas Bruce has uh, got more hot tech kind of experience. So, yeah, but Bruce is a regular customer because his office is at the distillery, so he can give me that kind of, um, you know, perspective from the customer as well. And he's gotten us onto social media, which is kind of a new thing for us. So. And we like it. <laughs> so just kind of, um, maybe we'll wrap things up soon. With coffee being such a competitive market, um, how did you sort of find ways to find that niche or was that just sort of your passion and didn't necessarily think about all the marketing strategy behind it? And um, just to follow up on that, there's a question about the Ryerson location and if you've done any different type of marketing considering um, the high traffic of more students necessarily than in a kind of community with um, residents and such. Yeah. Um, so, well, what was the first part of your question, Ken? I was just thinking about the Ryerson. Story. The first part was sort of the marketing and whether or not okay, you really thought I... about the niche. Um, and... I, no, I did not really think about it, although I, I did know that I wasn't going to create something that has already been done before. So um, I think my skill is is that I'm a really good customer. I've traveled a lot. I shopped a lot. I love going to cafes. So I kind of knew what was a, a really great concept and what wasn't because I had so many experiences as a customer. So um, I think it was a combination of my timing, um, that experience and skill that I brought to it. And you know, I created a concept that is sort of classic. It's based on old style French cafes. So I'm not subject to all the trends in the industry. I don't have to keep up with the latest drinks. I mean, it's such a multi-billion dollar industry. People are always like coming up with new things to like to be the next new fad. And I can just ignore all that. I don't go to coffee trade shows. I just do my thing. And uh, and I, you know, I think that's what set me apart is probably just not trying to, you know, too hard to find that niche. And as in terms of um, Ryerson, it is a little bit more challenging for us. I mean, the cafe is doing great. What we do, we are doing well, but we also were introducing more food, and that was part of what Ryerson had wanted us to do. So it's kind of a new side of the business. We don't have a kitchen, so we have to bring, and, and we couldn't have a kitchen, the space wouldn't allow it, so we have to bring food in from off-site, and, and that's kind of like, oh, you know, this is a whole kind of food industry that I purposely did not want to get into, so to be honest, I, uh, I could be um, more focused and working harder on that, but for me, as long as the coffee is good, that's, we are coffee roasters, that's what our company is, and that's something about branding, right? You stick, do one thing and do it well. You know, the food, we want to have good, high quality food, and that's, that is what the challenge is, by the way, it's trying to get that supplier that will, you know, bring in consistent, good, healthy food that, that is very challenging and that is at a price point that the students will be able to handle. So it's basically impossible. <laughs> but, you know, I don't want to bring in peanut butter and jam sandwiches. You know, it's, it's a tough thing to do. So we're trying to do that. We're working on a, a student blend, a coffee blend that's uh, made with beans that are a little bit less expensive, still high quality Arabica beans, but uh, we're working on a blend that we can bring that price point down for brewed coffee that's just student blend that will only be available in Ryerson, but you don't have to be a student to drink it. <laughs> so uh, we're doing little things like that, but um, yeah. I mean, 
We try to do things the same in all the cafes too. If we do one thing in one cafe, and then not in, at the distillery, we hear about it for the customers because they like to jump around to all the cafes. And we hear about it, our staff hears about it, and uh, it, it can complicate things. Okay, so I have a uh, kind of wrap up question here. So it's obviously important to talk about the hard times and the hard parts of starting a business and the sort of best moments of starting a business. So um, what would you say the toughest time was for you or sort of your biggest failure? And what would you say was your largest success and sort of the best time in this whole process for you? I, well, I guess the Niagara Falls location, for sure, is our biggest failure. It's our only failure, really. Um, big failure. I mean, there's little failures on a daily basis, but... Uh, um, so, yeah, that answers that part of the question. Um, but you know what? Like Arlene said, we learned from that experience. And um, we minimized the damage that, of that. Um, it ended up being more of a relocation than a closing down because because we were approached by a landlord in Niagara-on-the-Lake who wanted us to open there, and we have a gorgeous location there. It's in an old train station. So that was like, okay, this is perfect timing for me to shut this one down and, and re relocate to Niagara-on-the-Lake. Um, the best... The best thing that's happened, the best, uh, what was the other second part of the question? The sort of your biggest success, the or what biggest success. your sort of happiest moment in this whole process? Um, hmm. I mean, there's been many. Uh, I think the most exciting was, was with the distillery district. Um, it, I mean, it was just amazing being able to see those buildings vacant and to go through them all. Um, it had been abandoned since the distillery had shut down for many years. And they were so pres well preserved and untouched. And I, you know, I got to spend an entire day going through them. And, and to actually build that cafe and to open it and took a couple years. For our first two years, our only customers were construction workers, like coming into my marble floors with their muddy boots and um, and we did it uh, like you know we did it on a, a really I can't believe the budget we had and we actually pulled that off we didn't have heat for the first year so we had this big blower blowing heat through a, a window um, with this anyways it was fun times but that is that that was the game changer that cafe and um, I still, to this day, just, you know, I'm just so thank God that I had the opportunity to be in that setting, that beautiful, beautiful building, so, yeah, and I mean, you know, the whole Dragon's Den thing, that was kind of fun, and, you know, I think that was a game changer, too, so, yeah, two exciting moments in, in the career path, so. Excellent. Well, that's going to wrap that up. I know Deanna is also a very busy woman and has a young daughter as well, so. Um, on behalf of the Ryerson Marketing Association, again, we would like to extend a huge thank you to Deanna for welcoming her time and actually commuting all the way from St. Catharines for us. <laughs> to compliment, thank you, it's my pleasure to be here. To compliment her um, love of all the French things and inspired for the cafe, we've put together a little French gift basket for Very Deanna. Nice. So thank you very much for coming in. It's been greatly appreciated and all the work put into everything. So thank you.